couple of issues were raised, and I think um, they are interesting. Just the last speaker raised what I think is one of the quintessential issues we face is that by the governance structure, we don't have the ability to be able to make the decisions on how money is expended. We simply approve a list of additional items that uh, are presented to us by the TransLink board. Um, just, Mr. Jarvis, how long have you been with TransLink? Boy, uh, since 2001. 2001, and now, so that's 10 years. And, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the frustrations, you know, often we don't look at staff. We, we say it's political responsibility to make all of these decisions. And, uh, and it's our fault if we make bad quality decisions. And, and sometimes I think we have to look at the advice we're receiving. We have to consider the advice that we're receiving. It's a difficult job at TransLink to be operating with several masters. I mean, you've got the TransLink board, but you also have the provincial government acting on one side with their own transportation plan and very clearly their own agenda. who are accessing the board, accessing staff, and then you have us on the other side, the municipalities and uh, Metro Vancouver. Now, uh, earlier, uh, Director Robertson was saying, you know, we have to connect the dots. Well, unfortunately, it's very difficult to connect those dots. In fact, those dots have been unconnected for some time. Um, the connection between the regional growth strategy and, and planning for transportation has been non-existent. The whole purpose of TransLink coming over <coughs> to municipalities was to coordinate our growth with our transportation planning, but in fact it now works in two silos, in two solitudes. Uh, the idea that there is a connection between those dots is, is simply wrong, because we don't have the ability, as Director Sakura has pointed out, to make any decisions. You know, the, the budget that's presented to us, we've got $120 million in capital coming in each year from the gas tax money. So that's capital. It's not operating money. It's straight capital money. But we have no ability to say where that capital money is going to go. So we may have choices. Now, now you have to look at it and say, well, if we got $120 million in capital coming in, how come we cut $3 million off of bicycle lanes? How come they chose to cut $5 million off of the MRN? You know, the roadmap. Why were those choices made on that 120 million? Would we have made those choices if we had a control? Why do we get only a portion of the capital budget to consider in prioritization of our needs in the region? Is it what happens is TransLink considers what their board wants to fund first, using the capital funds that are available and the borrowing power available with their own operating budget and capital budget. And then anything that we might want, anything that can be dangled in front of us to entice us to voting for a supplement, is included in a supplementary budget. You know, so that, that's one of the, the real problems in dealing with TransLink, is that we have no ability to control any of the mechanisms, so what we get is whatever they want us to see. And at the end of it are what are the most controversial projects. Now, I'm quite happy to say right here that Given the needs of other municipalities across the region, and despite the fact that there is significant growth in Metrotown, I'm happy to deprioritize Metrotown Station as a priority, given and put it off until we have the funding formula in place for Metrotown to, to be done. And I think it would be fair if Vancouver said the same about Main Street and if Surrey said the same thing about Surrey Central. That given the priorities we've got, if there's $100 million in capital that doesn't need to be ex expended until the point where we have a funding agreement in place, then let's do that. Let's look at having that funding agreement in place before we move ahead with those capital expenditures. Um, but they're scheduled to go ahead in 2012. That doesn't make any sense. We need to be able to look at a capital budget and be able to say, what isn't necessary to move ahead right now? what needs to be done right now. And as Director Brody pointed out, it was uh, the need to be able to go ahead with the Evergreen Line as a central priority. If we move ahead with that project and not moving ahead with other projects makes good sense. But we we don't end up with control of that. As as said by, uh, by Mr. Jarvis, it's simply take it or leave it. Our position is we do all of these things. Now, my suspicion 
in this, you know, and I want to be perfectly candid about this, is that in their business case for Fairgates, they didn't include $100 million to fix those three stations. And so they can't put in the Fairgates unless they do $100 million in renovations to those three stations. So I'm saying, not important. It's not on my list of priorities to ensure that Metrotown goes before a uh, additional buses to provide net late night service in Vancouver. Is that it's not my priority that uh, that Main Street Station, despite being older, goes ahead of having additional service in Langley. You know, and we need and we don't get a chance to debate those issues. We don't get a chance to be part of the decision, and that's the frustration and the reason that we can't can't control the process that's in front of us or make it dovetail with the needs of our municipalities and the needs of our, our regional growth strategies. It is simply a dangle in front of the politicians the things they'll buy, more bike paths, more, uh, more MRN money. And in reality, is we're left without the decision-making capacity to look at the whole of the budget or the necessary choices that, that are required for intelligent people to make intelligent decisions. And that's not happening. And uh, now we're in a position, you know, Mr. Mr. Jarvis, we're in a position where you have been part of this system for a number of years. In 2009, we came in to this system after all of the advice from you and other senior officials at TransLink, we came in with $160 million systemic deficit. $160 million in systemic deficit. And that meant that we had to raise $130 million in order to avoid the system being bombed back into the 1970s. And that was the words of Translin. You had to find $30 million of cuts. And the thing we said at that point in 2008, 2009, we all swore of open blood that we weren't going to do this again. That there had to be, over the next two years, a decision made as to how we were going to fund this system. And yet, here we are two years later, again, in brinksmanship, and again, working towards the next precipice, where 2015, when the Evergreen Line comes on service, we don't know how much it's going to cost. We don't know what the additional costs are going to be. Some other poor group of politicians is going to have to deal with the bomb it back to the 1980s, or we end up having to get a, another $100 million of, uh, of capital or operating expenses to make that go. We cannot operate a system in which we are in the middle of the summer consulting with the public about spending a billion dollars, a billion dollars, and raising taxes. We'll, we'll have raised it by 35% over the course of these three years if we do this is that we can't consistently do this. And then in August, go out and do it, because I guess because TransLink figures this is the time there'll be the least public attention paid to this. Well, that's not what I want. I want the public to be well aware of this, and all of us who are going into an election should be prepared to face the wrath of the voter if we choose to make these kind of decisions. A billion dollars. This means that TransLink is going to take up 40% of all of the debt owed by all of the municipalities in British Columbia will be on TransLink. It's not sustainable. It can't be sustained. And we're in a position now where you keep talking about $23 per citizen. Is it what we're doing with a billion dollars of, expense, of, of expenditures is putting $500 of debt on every person, man, woman, and child in this region that they have to pay. And another $100 a year for every man, woman, and children child that has to absorb the cost of this system. So I, I say that there needs to be real consideration of whether we move forward and that we make it contingent that the gov provincial government doesn't get what they want until we get a governance system that will address the need for us to be able to connect the dots.